I get paid to navigate nightmares. I just encountered the most vile one yet. As the title suggests, I get paid to traverse people's nightmares. Well, I did. Relaying this story is a breach of my non-disclosure agreement. But I don't care. I need to tell someone. It's only a matter of time before they track me down anyway. I work for Hoa Redacted Nikur. Located at Hoa Redacted. I don't know why I'm telling you this. They have a software that censors the company's name anywhere it's posted on the internet. And that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the technology that these people have at their disposal. That's why my time is short. Once I post this, they'll have my exact coordinates. I'm done for. And I've accepted that. But if I can save even one of you from going down this path, then my extermination will not be in vain. I've been doing this for about a year now. I've had four different partners in that time, all of whom have met their untimely demise as a direct result of our line of work. I can already sense the question forming on your lips. If so many people have bit the dust, why do I stay? Same reason you're working that shitty dead-end job you hate, money. I make more cash every month than most people accumulate in their entire lifetime. Well, that, and I signed a three-year contract. But none of it matters now. The technology that lets us infiltrate people's dreams is experimental. Technically, it hasn't even been officially cleared for use. My co-workers and I are all essentially guinea pigs collecting data for some big corporation that doesn't give a rat's ass about any of us. But we were all well aware of that going in. God, I wish I'd never accepted that job offer. I was training a newbie when it happened. The kid was only 19. He didn't last long. All right, so when the creep show presents itself, I'll point this ray gun, looking thing at it, and fire. The suits are equipped with some sort of homing tech. If we get separated, push the button on the side of your helmet. Got it? Uh, I think so. Josh shrugged awkwardly, flashing me a tepid half-smile. I mentally facepalmed myself. One look, and I could tell that he didn't have it in him. But there was nothing I could do about it. He'd already signed his life away. I was knocked back to reality by the sound of the sliding glass door whirring open. I turned to see one of the suits standing at the entrance. They all looked the same. Shaved heads, full black attire, and shades to match. If you didn't know any better, you'd assume they stepped straight out of a Men in Black movie. Agents C-7B and ZH-4. The subject has been inoculated. Great. Time for your first gig. I hope you're ready, I said, snatching the purple and yellow ray gun from Josh's hand. Nah, now? I just started an hour ago. Don't you think I need a little more training? You're getting hands-on training today. This is a two-man job, and you're all I've got. Besides, most nightmares are an open and shut case. This thing will do the work for us, I retorted, nodding to the cartoonish weapon in my grip before starting down the hallway. Josh opened his mouth to speak, but thought better of it, trotting to catch up to me and Baldy. We silently strode down a long, brightly lit corridor until we reached our destination. From the moment the door clicked open, I knew that this patient was going to be trouble. A boy no older than twelve was sleeping fitfully in an operating chair. A mess of brown, tangled locks 
peeked out from beneath the bulky metal helmet secured snugly to his head. The dark bags underneath his eyes spoke volumes. What is that thing? Josh whispered, pointing to the jumbled mass of cables extending from the helmet to a plethora of computer screens. It monitors his brain activity. It's also what lets us get into his head. Well, sort of. That has a lot to do with it too, I said, motioning toward the blue illuminated teleportation pad in the left corner of the room. I watched as Josh's jaw fell open involuntarily. A pang of guilt struck my chest, like a lightning bolt. Though I tried to convince myself otherwise, I knew that there was a high likelihood that this would be Josh's first and final mission. But I couldn't tell him that, even if I wanted to. You see, the last partner I'd had, the one before Josh, he tried to walk away, to leave it all behind. Well, he did get to leave, in a body bag. I attempted to rid my mind of those awful thoughts, but it wasn't easy. I knew going in that this particular patient would be no walk in the park. Kids his age had the worst nightmares. They're young enough to maintain that vivid, childlike imagination, yet old enough to recognize some of the more sinister realities of the world, which usually coalesces to create something downright demented. Got any useful intel? I asked Baldy while slipping into my orange jumpsuit. Garrett Crane, age 11. Nightmare classification, unknown. I don't think any human is capable of sounding more monotone than that man. They all speak like that too. The guards, the scientists, even the big boss. It's like being a mindless drone is a prerequisite to being hired. Thanks. Very helpful, I grumbled as I picked up a small vacuum-like device from the table beside me. Here, take this, I demanded, slapping it into Josh's hand. What's it do? I call that the Gluck Gluck 3000. When I blast the monstrosity with this, it'll leave behind an essence. It'll look like a little ball of light. You get to suck it up with that, so the eggheads can study it. Come on. You get the fun job. I'm basically a glorified janitor. Do I even get anything to defend myself with? Yeah. You get this, I said, dropping a pocket knife into his outstretched palm. Really? What the hell is this? It's your only chance at survival if we get separated. Look, these are the only weapons they've given us. If you want out, take it up with them, I retorted, nodding to the two burly, motionless men standing by the entrance. Josh gulped, the color draining from his face. Uh, nah. On second thought, this will do. Great. Let's get this show on the road. The faster we get this over with, the faster I can get to the McDonald's drive through I walked over to the teleportation pad with Josh tethered to my side. He inhaled deeply, then blew out a slow breath. You got this, kid. Stick with me and you'll be okay. And remember, if we ever get separated, hit that button on your helmet immediately. Got it? Yeah, I got it. I'm ready. Josh glanced up at me with a fiery determination I hadn't known he possessed. Maybe he'd be okay after all. I flashed a thumbs up to the researcher behind the monitors watching as they flipped switches and turned dials on the control panel. A soft buzz began to emanate from the glowing pad below our feet. My body began to tingle, like it was made of static. I squeezed my eyes shut as the world grew hazy around me. When I opened them again, 
I found myself in a world of black. I turned to Josh. Even through the visor on his helmet, I could see the bewilderment in his expression. His eyes looked like they were about to burst from his skull, and he was pale as a ghost. I chuckled to myself. The first job is always a shock to the system. Wh wh where are we? Josh squeaked, frantically gazing around the empty void. We're in the kid's mind. Help me find the target, I said, scanning the horizon. Okay, um, what am I looking for, exactly? We're looking for a building of some sort, I replied, squinting. There. Do you see it? Josh strained his eyes, peering in the direction I was pointing. Far off, barely even visible, stood a house. Yeah, I think. How do we get over there, though? We walk. How else would we get there? Josh groaned. But that's so far. It's really not, I said, as we proceeded toward the tiny speck. Time and distance work differently here, see? Josh glanced up and stopped dead in his tracks. The house was looming menacingly over us. What the fu- He was right to be in awe. That house was seriously screwed up. Every window had been smashed in, revealing an all-encompassing darkness in each room. Yellow, grungy paint was peeling over the entire exterior of the structure like a snake shedding its skin. But the most peculiar thing was the door. It was untouched by the rot plowing the rest of the home. It looked normal, aside from the jet black paint job and the pentagram carved into the center, that is. Josh, turn on your helmet light and follow closely behind me. We have no idea what we're going to find in there. He nodded and tapped the flashlight on the front of his head. I did the same, raising the ray gun. Three, two, one. I turned the knob and stepped across the threshold. I was met with a dingy, poorly lit hallway. A brown door glared at me from the opposite end of it. Josh followed closely behind me as I took a tentative step forward. Feels like we're walking underwater, he noted as we continued down the hall. Yep. We're in it now. No turning back. I watched a shudder ripple through Josh's body as we reached the end of the hallway. The door hovered ominously before us, beckoning me to turn the handle. Before we do this, I want you to be prepared. What we're about to see will probably be really, really fucked up. Stay on your toes. Got it, Josh said that burning ambition returning to his visage. I slowly reached for the knob. Hey, do you hear that? Josh hissed, before I had a chance to turn it. I paused, pressing my ear to the wood. Yeah, it sounds like... crying. Steal yourself. No point in waiting any longer. I pushed open the door, white-knuckling the ray gun. The hinges creaked as I scanned our surroundings. It was obvious that the room had belonged to a child. Action figures and Legos and spaceships littered the floor. The ceiling was illuminated by a smattering of plastic stars, shining like an imitation night sky. The wallpaper depicted trains chugging along an endless track. It would have been picture perfect if it wasn't for the woman sitting on the bed. My heart began racing like a piston as she slowly turned towards us. Pitch black hair obscured her features from view. She continued to weep, her hands shielding her face. Ma ma'am, Josh whispered, his voice barely audible. Huge mistake. The woman's head whipped up, turning my blood to ice. She had no eyes 
Maggots wriggled and writhed from the empty sockets, falling to her lap in endless droves. The woman scooped up a handful of the fat, white larvae and began shoveling them into her mouth like candy. She greedily chomped down on the repulsive creatures. A wet squelch escaped her lips as green, viscous liquid dribbling down her chin. I could feel bile climbing up my throat as I aimed the ray gun. I didn't hesitate. I pulled the trigger, reducing the abomination to ash. I glanced over at Josh. He lifted his visor and emptied his lunch onto the carpeted floor. I lightly slapped him on the back as he spat the remainder of the puke from his mouth. You're up. See that glow? That's all you, I said, pointing to a faint red light floating above the blankets. Easy enough, Josh said, the color flushing back into his cheeks. He lifted the vacuum-esque device and flipped the switch. The light traveled through the tubi and into the storage compartment. All right, that should be it. I'll contact the team to pull loose. Whoa, my eyes grew wide as dinner plates. The room around you started to dissolve. Colors twisted and swirled, an amalgamation of roiling shapes blurring the scene around us. What? What's going on? Josh muttered, staring in awe alongside me. I don't know. This has never happened before. After a moment, I squeezed my eyes shut and took a deep breath. The whole thing was making me queasy. When I opened them again, I found myself standing in a warehouse. Boxes were piled so high that they nearly touched the ceiling. Forklifts sat scattered throughout the building, gathering dust. Dim, flickering lights cast the entire expanse in a bleak, eerie glow. A gnawing sensation settled into my gut. Something felt wrong. Come on, let's go. Um, Josh? My partner was nowhere to be found. Shit. Remember the button, kid, I murmured, praying that Josh would return to my side at any moment. But I couldn't afford to wait for him. If I stayed put, I'd be a sitting duck for whatever was lurking in the darkness. I began to make my way toward the center of the gargantuan warehouse. I crept along past countless boxes and conveyor belts. I didn't see a soul. I walked for what felt like hours. I could have sworn that I'd passed the same toppled box six or seven times. Just when I was thinking that I might be trapped in a time loop, I saw it. A mid-sized brown parcel sat atop a rusted steel table. A message was scrawled on the parchment in crimson. It simply read, Open me. My head began to swim. I grabbed the box cutter that lay beside the package, attempting to steal my nerves for what I would find. But nothing could prepare me for what lay inside. I sliced open the box and peeled back the flaps, ray gun raised in my other hand. I kneeled over and blew chunks all over the smooth, cold ground once my eyes drank in the horror within. Josh's head stared back at me. The knife I'd given him jutted from his forehead. The boy's green eyes peered at me from inside his mouth, which was twisted into a permanent, soundless scream. His teeth had been removed and piled into his eye sockets, glimmering white porcelain coated in red. It was only then that I noticed his tongue. It was perched on top of his helmet, right beside a bloody handprint narrowly missing the homing button. He'd been so close, just a couple inches to the left, and my partner would be standing next to me shaken, but mostly unscathed. I wanted to drop to my knees, 
to hold what I had left of the poor kid and bawl my eyes out. But they didn't give me a chance. A shadow raced across my vision, shattering my reverie. They were approaching from all directions. Right, left, directly ahead. Whatever those things were, they were fast, and they were closing in on me like orcas circling their prey. My heart exploded against my ribcage as my back collided with the wall. How many of them were there? I couldn't tell. They used the shadows like camouflage. Every time I turned my head, another one would scurry closer. Shh, show yourselves, I demanded, recklessly pointing the ray gun at anything that moved. I don't know what made me say that. In all likelihood, those things wouldn't be human. Nevertheless, they understood my command. One of the monstrosities stepped into the low, flickering light. What I saw paralyzed me with fear. A humanoid figure stood before me. Red, angry veins and sinew pulsated in a skinless body. Its eyes were wild and bloodshot, barely contained inside their lidless cavities. Its lower jaw was completely missing. A long, wet tongue swayed back and forth like a pendulum with each step. Its lungs sat outside of its body, each labored breath resulting in the shallow rise and fall of twin fleshy, pink masses. But what terrified me the most wasn't any of that. It was its hands. Stark white bone protruded from each mutilated digit. Razor sharp claws gleamed like butcher knives in the scarce light. They were twitching, primed to kill. The ray gun trembled in my grasp as more of them emerged from the darkness. They were everywhere. Dozens and dozens of mangled, disfigured abominations crawled from every nook and cranny in the facility. There were too many. Blood pounded in my ears as I cautiously flipped open the cover over my left wrist. I pressed the red plastic button and a screen illuminated blue. I whispered as quietly as I could, hoping that my message would come across clearly without setting those things off. Command. Requesting immediate extraction. Emergency. A voice crackled through the tiny speaker, ringing throughout the warehouse. What was that, CB7? We couldn't hear you. My face drained of color. That was all it took. The hellish beasts charged toward me all at once, trampling each other to reach me. Adrenaline coursed through my system, kicking my fight or flight into overdrive. My brain chose both. Command, I need an extraction. Now, abort mission. I repeat, abort mission. I screamed into the receiver as I fired a barrage of bright yellow beams into the encroaching mass. I was doomed. This was how I was going to die. Torn to shreds by an army of ungodly freaks created by a child's tortured mind, I squeezed my eyes shut and unleashed a shriek as a jagged claw raked my ankle. Thousands upon thousands of images assaulted my brain at once. Images of loved ones. Images of personal milestones. Images of better times. A single tear rolled down my cheek. I wasn't ready to die. I kept screaming expecting an onslaught of knife-like appendages to slice into my body at any given moment. But they never did. I awoke in the lab, garnering confused stares from the researchers and security team. They'd beamed Josh back too. Blood oozed from the gaping wound in his decapitated body. That only made me scream louder. Poor kid didn't deserve that. Once the team managed to calm me down, I was told to take some time off. Paid sick leave to get my head on straight, they said. 
Little do they know, I'll be leaving for good. I've come to terms with it over the past few days. Death, that is. I don't know what good this post is going to do, but I'm hoping that someone out there might know something that can bring this corporation to its knees. Too many people are needlessly losing their lives to this, and if I can prevent even one more death, then this will all be worth it. This is goodbye. Heed my warning. If you ever come across an ad looking for a nightmare navigator, whatever you do, do not apply. Chances are, you won't live to tell about it. Thanks for watching and subscribe our channel to watch daily scary stories.